I had sent one to Scott a couple of years ago on Craigslist. It was huge, so it, it was changed. God, we want to be here to honor you today, Lord. You said, let everything that has breath praise you, God. And you are worthy to be praised from the coming up till the going down of the sun, Lord. So often we're unmindful of you, God. We're distracted by everything under the sun, but fail to seek those things which are above. We fail to set our mind on things above so we can be transformed into that same image. We fail to fulfill our purpose for being under the sun, Lord. I think of the words of the Apostle Paul to redeem the time, God, to make the most of every opportunity to be mindful of those inside and outside of the faith. Help us to be mindful of them and our children, God, who are seeing the faith in us. God, we need a miracle today. We need a resurrection before the resurrection. We need a resurrection after your resurrection, God. God, you have the words of spirit and life, Lord. Give us ears to hear and to not be forgetful. Hears, God, but for us to be doers of the word, God. Do a miracle in us. Raise us to life afresh today, God, that we might praise you and live for your glory. Amen. We thank you, Lord. So you can turn to uh, John chapter 11. We'll be looking just briefly and uh, kind of sporadically at Lazarus. We won't go through the whole story. The whole story is two chapters long. John gives a lot of attention to this uh, raising up of a dead man, rightfully so. Amen? And what's also interesting and characteristic to the book of John is that John decides to make uh, seven I am statements or to record them is a better way of putting it. Jesus says that he's the bread of life. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the door. He's the gate. He's the good shepherd. Um, and he says many statements about himself, but what we'll see in this passage is he says that I'm the resurrection and the life. And John also records seven miracles of Jesus. We don't really have the I am statements of Jesus recorded in any other gospel. That's only characteristic to John. And also six of the seven miracles that John records aren't found in any other gospel book as well. The only one that's found in the others is actually found in all of them, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. So What's interesting about this particular passage, though, is that this is the last sign that John records of Jesus doing. And we have to ask the question, well, why would this be the last sign? I mean, it's only chapter 11 of a book that's 20-some chapters long. And John himself says that, if we had enough books to write about all the signs and all of the sermons and all of the good things and the character of Jesus, the world wouldn't be big enough to contain them all. And I was talking to Zach the other day, and he said he was thinking about that. And he says, I can't even fathom that just thinking in terms of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> you know, we know how big the Grand Canyon is. You think about that many episodes, that many incidents 
of touching people's lives, of saying words with resurrection power and doing great and mighty and notable things, the whole world wouldn't be big enough to contain all of those things. And obviously that's a figure of speech, but that's a truth. And that'll be true when we get to heaven and see Jesus Christ face to face, just like the angels when they get a glimpse of his glory in Isaiah 6. It's a new continuous revelation every moment of every day for eternity and eternity that we will just cry out at his holiness. And it won't just be a crying out and amazement, it will be a transformation into that same thing the Bible says. John says, it hasn't even been revealed what we shall be. But we do know this, this much we know, that when we see him face to face, we'll be like him. For we'll be changed into that same image, Paul even says. And that's not to go to an extreme to say we'll be equal or greater than him, but in character and love and kindness and in glory and brilliance. Man, we have no idea what we shall be. But this is the last miracle that John records. And I think it's simply for this purpose. It's to kind of get us to think, well, how come there's not any more miracles? It's to show the supremacy of this miracle. John says that these things are written, these signs are recorded so that you might believe. So all throughout the book so far, Jesus has been doing signs. His first was at the wedding. It says many believe. Then he heals the nobleman's son. You know, then he, he does six other miracles besides this one. And they're all believing. But John, for some reason, he just puts these things about the people who are so-called believing that it would make a question mark about their faith. Even his own disciples, they would believe one moment but then Jesus would do something and John says they wouldn't really get that or understand or believe till after he was glorified. Or in other words, after he was resurrected. Even John himself says when he goes into the tomb, it was then that he believed. So, so, so what's going on here? I just think that it's simply this, that all of the things Jesus was doing was kind of like John the Baptist. It's just a preface for his greatest miracle, which is him being crucified on a cross. That's where the power was at. That's when the resurrection happened. That's when the earth was shaken and the veil in the temple, Matthew records, was ripped in two, signifying, inviting God's heart, being fulfilled, calling man back into sinful man, into the holy of holies. Rocks shook and split and men came out of the grave at the same time and walked around the city. Proofs of the greatest miracle, the death, burial, and resurrection, the sanctifying of a sinful man. That's a miracle. And not just the making him righteous, but creating in him a heart that would long to do what God has called him to do and be able to do it. That's a miracle. Have you had that miracle? You know, me, me and June, just, just kind of on a different note, we, we went on this trip. And we were waiting for it. We were blessed by um, just brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. No, you know, just blessed us and took care of our kids and even did their homework with them and you know that's the hard part we were so blessed um and so this trip that we were going on it was about 10 days and then we'd come back and then take the kids for a short road trip so the trip started out really good as i was driving across the bridge with mac i got this reminder in my phone that my flight was at 6 30 
but it was 6.30 already. And so I said, June, I didn't react the right way. I said, I said June, uh, we're done because our flight was at 6.30. So we got there, and the Lord provided a way through a friend that she had. They got us some standby tickets. He's a pilot. Uh, got us tickets day of like that. We were gone in a few hours. It cost us 400 bucks for both of us to get over there. That was cheaper than, than what I had bought online like a month before. Back home, we didn't have such luck. It cost us about 1600 to get home. But, uh, you know, aside from that, we had some difficulties of, you know, the plane company told us that we our flights back would still be good on the major portion of them. You know, we called four or five times. Each one of these phone calls is an hour and a half long to this music that drives you drives you crazy. So, and, you know, we got along, no problems during that whole time, you know. But when we showed up at the airport, of course, our flights weren't good. So what I found out and we learned was that if you miss any one portion of your flights, they cancel the rest of every single one of your flights. So, um, but the Lord provided, but here, here's what I wanted to get to. When we got home, you know, we didn't have any fights the whole time, but then you put us in, in the car with the kids for like seven days on a road trip you know, you're not acting so the same way you were when you were in Greece riding around in a rental car with just you and your wife like your teenagers or something. So, um, but on the way back, uh, I just really began to be crushed because so often I was losing my temper with, with my kids. And, you know, I wasn't like yelling or screaming, but I, I was very impatient with them. I was harsh with them. Um, you know, it's not the way the Lord treats us. So I read this section here in John 11, and I was just crushed. And, and what I realized was that I was sick, man. I am sick. Like... I've got a sin problem. You know, I say I'm sorry and I try not to do it, but I'm, I'm doing it time and time again. To people that I love, I'm being a stumbling block to my kids entering the kingdom of God. Uh, then, you know, then you have the, the sexual temptations that come and everything like that. And I just realize how sick I am. And so I read this here about Lazarus. It says in verse 1, it says, A certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And you know, God began to crush me, and then one of the things that I noticed here about Lazarus, though, is the dude's never really recorded as doing anything for the Lord. You know, his two sisters are talked about in another book of the Bible. You see that Jesus was passing through, and Mary, uh, or, or Martha, excuse me, Martha invited Jesus to come into their home. And she started serving. Uh, then her sister, we know this story, instead of serving, she was actually doing the better thing. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, just holding on to every word that he said. So Lazarus isn't really mentioned there at all, even though he's their brother. And we wouldn't know anything about Lazarus if it wasn't for this story here. And you see the way that John introduces him. It's like he describes everybody else uh, and the things that everybody else did and the town that he's from. But really, even in the story, Lazarus never says a word. He's, he's never doing anything except getting raised up from the dead and just sitting at the table, you know. Um, and I think that this is just such a picture 
of us. You know, Lazarus' name, it's kind of like a baby name is, is what I was reading. It's like they're figuring maybe he's just the younger brother. He's the one. He's not quite serving like the older sister. He's not quite sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's kind of, you know, maybe in and out. We don't, we don't know. But his name, it means God is, is my help. And that just kind of furthers the fact that he, he may just be kind of this young guy. He, he hasn't done a lot. He's not that accomplished. Maybe he's not as spiritual as his sisters. And maybe he's just like me and you. Maybe he's struggling. And, you know, I mentioned my temper and, you know, temptations and things like that. But, man... James says we fall into various, various trials. And even in chapter 1, you know, when he's talking about temptations, he blessed is he who endures temptations and then passes temptations and trials. He's kind of using those words synonymously because, you know, I might not go through as many tribulations as somebody else in here, and they may, might not go as through many as somebody else in another country, but we all go through some. And I think for me, even though I don't see myself as going through a lot of tribulations, I mean, the temptations and the sin issue is nonstop, you know? And so we're sick. We need the Lord. And so what, what I love, though, is that even though... Lazarus and me and you were so sick and we're so depraved. Like Paul says, I'm, I'm convinced that is in me, in this fleshly body, nothing good dwells. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing, nothing good in us. The only good things that we do is either God restraining the spirit that's in us towards the things that we wouldn't even think that we do, or it's God's grace in us producing the opposite. We are sick, and yet we judge other people who are going, who are sick as well as if as if we're better than them. That that's not the case. It's not. But what I love about Jesus here is the next verse. It says in 3, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And that's what I love about Jesus. And that's the example for us today. With our families, with each other, Paul puts it in the context of every single relationship you could have in both Colossians and Ephesians. He says, uh, husbands, wives, uh, young people, children, fathers, employers, employees. You know, I just thank God that he loves us, even where we're at. Let's, let's look for a second how he loves us. Turn with me to, to Psalms 149. We're going to kind of go through this quickly, but may the Lord show us how he's loved us. One thirty nine. That clock hasn't been changed back there, right? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> so let's read through this real quick. This is the psalmist just beginning to comprehend a little bit about God's love for him. He says, Oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know. He knows us. And he loves us. He's searched us. He's known us. 
He even knows when we sit down and when we rise up. That's how attentive he is to us. He understands our thoughts. And man, I'm, I'm so thankful that nobody can read my mind because if you could read my mind or if I could read your mind, we wouldn't want anything to do with each other. We wouldn't love each other. We wouldn't come together. But God, he understands it all. And he loves us. He comprehends our path, our lying down. He's acquainted. Do you see, you see all these descriptive words here? He's acquainted. He comprehends. There's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And even though he knows us like that, he knows every single thought, every single inclination, every single possible way we could even go, good or bad, the, the depths of our heart and how wicked it is. I think it's Jeremiah says, the heart is wicked and deceitful above everything else in the world. Who can know it? But God, I test the heart. I know the mind. And here is the Lord. And the psalmist, he's about to say something that even though you know every single thing about me, you know where I could have went if it wasn't for you. You know where I go even after you. And yet, you've hedged me behind and before. You've even laid your hand on me how could you who is eternal and dwells in eternity and who's holy 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 why would you stop your day why would you think about me like this and not just say you love me or not just think about me but touch me You've laid your hand on me. Have we come to a point where we are utterly confounded by our own sin and utterly amazed at the grace of God and the sovereignty that he's placed over every single one of our lives? Man, I can't tell you how many times during worship, I've just looked around the room, standing in the back, and thought about people individually and how messed up we are. <laughs> Not in a judgmental way, but just how we all have issues. We're all so weak. We all have struggles. But where do we hit the pause button with each other? Do we say, I love you? Do we think about them? Or do we lay our hand on each other? This is the love of God. The Bible says be imitators of God. So then he, he just says this in seven. Where can I go? Even in my running. Even in my running. You, you follow me. You followed me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. But if I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there too. If I try to fly away, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will touch me and lead me. You'll continue to work with my stubborn heart. Great is his mercy. If I say surely darkness shall fall on me, if I just give up, even the night, you'll bust through and it'll turn into light around me. This is the faithfulness and the love of our God. Oh, how we fail. To exhibit that towards each other. Even though God has been so faithful to us. When do we stop? 
Is it when they're too sinful? Is it when they're too offensive? When their personality is too different from ours? God is saying he doesn't stop. And you are so different than him. You're so unlike him. You're so sinful than, than him. Great is the love of God. So 13, he says this, you form my inward parts. You've covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Look to, at his attention over us. That my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being un, even unformed. And in your book, all my days, they were written out. Imagine that. In your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me. When I was running, when I was hiding, when I was trying to get away, when I was sinning, God's been there through it all, keeping us, preserving us, loving us, praying for us, following us, busting Jesus, B.C., A.D., dying on a cross for us. How precious are your thoughts to me. Oh God, how, how great is the sum of them, the amount, if I should try to count how much you've been thinking of me, your thoughts which are for of peace and not of evil, they're for a future and a hope, they're to, to, to put a table in the presence of my enemies, all of your goodness, I couldn't count them. If I should try to number speaking figuratively, I'll just try to compare them to all the sands of the seas, not just in Madeira Beach, but around the whole earth that has ever been. Every single grain of sand Every single grain of sand, your thoughts are more in number than the sand of the sea. Thoughts of peace and redemption and kindness and persistence on God's part. This is why John says there aren't enough books that could be contained in the world to be written about the goodness and the grace and the truth and the kindness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is none like him. And you have found him. Or he's, you've been privileged enough to hear words of spirit and life and grace and truth. People on the other side of the planet our privilege to hear. He loves us even in our sickness. Look at Psalms 51 real quickly. Just to build up real quickly on what we've been talking about, he says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, because I'm just a Lazarus. God, you're my help. I should be way more mature than I am. I keep failing. I've messed it up. I murdered someone, I slept with someone, I'll do a census and kill people like that because I'm prideful, I'm just missing it, my family is a mess, have mercy on me. And he's faithful. The character of God, his loving kindness, the multitude, it's innumerable, his tender mercies, oh God, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, which is many. Cleanse me 
from my sins. Here's the sacrifice God wants. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin. It's always before me. I'm not just going to sweep it under a rug. I'm not just going to justify it. I'm not just going to ignore it. I'm going to cry out to you for you to have mercy on me, to wash me and to cleanse me, no matter what that washing machine might do to me. Put it on high speed, rough, if you have to. Not the gentle cycle. If I need something rough, turn it up. <laughs> My sin's always before me. I'm utterly broken against you, and you only have I sinned. The people as bad as that is, against you I've sinned. That's how sincere, heartfelt, and how great his faith is with his master. He's had a revelation of God's goodness and his kindness and how he's been following him and how he's hedged him in and he's touched him and yet he's sinned against him. He's not justifying He's not continuing. But there's a problem with me, God. I'm sick. I was brought forth, verse 5. Before I did anything, I was just conceived in sin. Is he saying my parents had an adulterous relationship? He's not saying that. He's talking about the death. Of his sin. The wretchedness, the wickedness, the inclinations of his heart, who no one can even know, will justify him in a heartbeat. But only God can test that. Only God can search that. Only God can put us in situations to cause that thing to bubble up so we see what's already there deep down on the inside, <laughs> laying dormant. Thinking we're holy. I was brought forth in iniquity and sin. My mother conceived me. This sack, this placenta that I was in, it's sin. Living, existing, surviving in a placenta of sin. The prophet says this, that when you were brought forth, your mother brought you forth in blood. You were like an aborted baby, a woman brought out of her womb and walked away from. You were so sinful in the vileness of your own inclinations and your selfishness and your adultery and your fornication and our gossip and our slander that everybody in the world would walk away from you. Even in your helplessness, in a baby-like state, but the only one who would pick us up in our blood and in our sin and in our feces and change our diapers was God. Praise God. In sin we were conceived. Purge me, God. Verse 7. Wash me. Hide your face, verse 9, from my sin. Quit looking at them. They're everywhere. Blot them out. Erase them. Create in me a clean heart. I need something, God. Renew a steadfast, not a momentary repentant spirit, but one that's steadfast. You desire fruits and a change. And just when I think I'm repenting, I'm doing it all over again. God, I'm dead. I'm sick. I need, you need, we need a steadfast spirit. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore. Restore. 
Verse 14, deliver. Verse 17, here's God's delight. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you won't despise. See, he knows how sinful we are. He knows how broken. He knows how we'll hit the repeat button on sin time and time again. And that we can't stop sinning. That we have to come to God every single moment. Every single day. That's why Scott's saying, plug in. We need each other. We need fellowship. Even when Lazarus was raised from the dead and Jesus raised him up and said, come forth. He wasn't like Jesus when he came out of the tomb where the grave closed. Jesus picked them up and folded them all nicely. They're all there proving and implying that nobody rushed in to steal the body of Jesus. No, Jesus woke up on his own. And he was just taking his time. He folded up his own, his own grave clothes. But Lazarus, when Jesus brought him forth, he told the people around him to take off the grave clothes. And what a picture of the body of Christ and how we need each other. And that's why the word says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need to encourage each other. You need to... Uh, uh, come alongside lest the deceitfulness of sin creep up and lest roots of bitterness between each other or between you and Lord spring up and defile many. No, we need to come. We need to gather. We need to love each other. We need to serve each other. This is the sacrifice that God desires because this is the only beginning point. This is the only dead body that he can do anything with. He, he, can't, he can't do anything with somebody else that doesn't want it. Or they refuse it and they refuse it. Even then, God is gracious. Even then, God is sovereign. But we're talking about being born again and resurrected. That's what the Bible calls repentance. And even that is a gift of God. God loves us. So, just quickly, let's look at how he loves us. Because God doesn't just talk about it. He doesn't just feel it. He doesn't just wish he could do it. He gets down and dirty, and he does it. Look at Isaiah 53 real quick. So... Just a little preface um, before we get into that. You'll see verse 13. It says this, that um, of, of chapter 52. This kind of flows together. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. That word prudently, you know, it means a few things, but in this context, it means wisely. Wisely, and I think that this servant, this uh, Messiah, this child, this guy in Isaiah, what, 7 and 9 or 11, that's coming, Isaiah has been talking about and seeing in chapter 6, because John says when Isaiah saw his glory in chapter 6, he saw the glory of Jesus Christ. You can see that right after this section here. No man has seen God at any time. But what they've seen, he who's declared him as Jesus Christ. He is the visible image of God. And so uh, Isaiah sees this Christ. He begins to prophesy and talk about him all the way up here. And he says, my servant shall deal prudently or wisely. And he's dealing in this prudent way. Jesus is going to come and do this deal in this prudent way. What's he talking about? Some master plan here it's acted out in in 53 that's the wisdom of god that's the prudence of god it's the plan of redemption but not the plan the action the love and action and so he's going to deal wisely 
He's going to create the greatest love story that has ever been told that no man could ever reproduce. He's going to die for his enemies. Never say a mumbling word. Just love them and stay on that cross and resurrect from the dead. So this Jesus, he's going to deal prudently. And I think Jesus deals wisely in a way that would hopefully teach us to live prudently in the same way as well. So he says, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And uh, the Jewish mindset, they can get right on that. They're needing deliverance, but failing. And even to this day, generally speaking, to see how God would bring that about. Just as many were astonished at you and these group of people that have been exiled and tore up. And people were astonished. They were raggedy looking. They were without anything. They were tore up. But let me tell you what. Their spiritual and physical state was nothing compared to what the servant was going to become. Because look, he says, just as many were astonished at you, so his face, his visage, his body is going to be marred than any other man. The torture and all the things that you guys have seen and been part of and the temptations and the problems. Hebrews says, you haven't resisted yet to bloodshed. Don't get weary. Consider him. Jesus marred more than any other man. Any other religious figure. More holy. More sacrificial. Jesus, the greatest love story, beat, marred more than any other man. His form, the ones the angels see and have to hide their face from, holy, 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 you can't even recognize, it says, that he's a man any longer. He's so beat up and bruised and swollen in his eyes, his beard's ripped off. He's wearing a crown of thorns, bearing pictorially the curse of humanity that God issued in Genesis. That by the sweat of your brow, the earth will no longer, it won't yield fruit like it did before. You're going to have to work and to labor. It's going to be hard. And Jesus coming as a man. Bearing the curse and the labor and the problems of man. And him who should have had a royal crown bearing on his skull. Beat down, not with sweats of, of water, but of blood and capillaries. And a bruised forehead. The curse of humanity. This is the wisdom of God. And Jesus says... As the Father has sent me, he'll say that a couple chapters later. That's how I'm sending you. Paul will say, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. How can you not forgive? How can you not serve? How can you not be patient? How can you not be long-suffering? Do you know what they did to me? Do you know what you've done to God? This is the wisdom of God. This is the teaching of the Lord. Skip to 53. He says this, who's believed our report? And in the context, who's believed that this child will be born of a virgin? Who 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 believed they didn't believe that they told Jesus he was born out of fornication they didn't they didn't believe that who believed that Jesus would be the everlasting father in chapters 9 and they didn't believe that they wanted to stone him for saying that I am my father of one they, they don't believe that about Jesus to this day who's believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed to well to the Jewish nation but they haven't believed but here John, Isaiah is going to say, let me tell you a little bit more. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Not as, as some strong, 
oak tree, but fleshly speaking in a body that's tender, that's weak. This is how he loves us. He doesn't just love us, but he come and he wraps himself in the same grave clothes as me and you. And now Hebrews says, we have such a more faithful high priest as if God wasn't faithful enough in Psalms 139 and 51, he would come because he loves us so much and want to be even more faithful to us, want to be more compassionate. Hebrew says we have a faithful high priest. He, he's, he, he's been on all points, all points now, tempted as we are. And he sympathizes with our weaknesses even more than he did before when he knew our frame, but we were but dust. He was in all points tempted. And now it says that he's even touched with our feelings, the feelings of our weaknesses. Jesus came as a tender plant just to be able to sympathize and to minister to you better. What a God. Are we like that? A tender plant, a root, nothing, nothing pretty. You know, I always think about this little interstate that's over, right over my dad's old house down on Burlington Avenue and 20th Street. There's this overpass. You just hear the cars, but you look up on that overpass and just somehow there's like this root growing out of concrete somehow. And somehow it's, it's surviving. And man, that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He came as a tender plant, but he didn't come with riches. He wasn't living it up in lush places. He came, he came on the side of an interstate. He came and he lived in concrete. Even before he was born, his parents are on the run. He had to, he, he, they had to ride a donkey into Bethlehem, but then they had to go to Egypt. And then when they thought they could come back, they couldn't come back. They're traveling to Nazareth. I mean, the dude, had it, he had it rough. He was born in a cave in a manger. This is our God. He was in all points tempted, all points tried to minister to us, to love us. This is how he loves. He has no form or comeliness. He wasn't this Brad Pitt savior that we see in the pictures that are hanging on the walls. The dude, you might have really been thinking how he's kind of ugly. If you saw him, you just wouldn't want to say it. But he wasn't a good-looking dude. Like, you didn't want to go and ride out with him. You know, he wasn't having the flashy clothes. Like, it, it was tough to be with Jesus. So he was despised. And here, the author just starts to tell you what Jesus not only lived like, but became into. And Paul says that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. And you'll hear this first quoted in here, that by his stripes we were healed, and two New Testament passages. And the first time, which all the charismatics like to use in the book of Matthew, Jesus heals somebody, and it says, Matthew says this was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53 that by his stripes were healed. But then you've got the conservative Baptists. They don't like to use it in that sense. They like to only use it in the sense of Peter where he's talking about how we all like sheep have gone astray and by his stripes we were healed and that we've returned spiritually to the shepherd of our soul. Is one true and not the other? No, they're both true. That's the only reason why we have a glorified body that's without sin or sickness. Because Jesus bore both. He became those things. So he became, he bore our griefs. Verse 4. He carried our sorrows. And our attitude about that 
Well, we just thought that he was stricken or smitten by God. Remember when he was on the cross? They're saying, oh, he's just cursed by God. We, we thought, humanity thought, that's just what he deserved. He was wrong. We couldn't, we couldn't even recognize the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ if it wasn't for him. But he's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. He's been smitten for us. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The cost, the punishment for me and you to have peace, it was upon him. It was the rods to the skull. It was the nails through the hand. I was thinking this morning as I was in the outer court, you know, over there we've got a much more uh, rugged cross over there. Like John Gavin, right, made the one over there. John's a realist. John, the one that John made, has got some rope on it. It's all bloodied. It's got some nails on it. And I was just thinking, and then I was looking at Trace's picture right next to it and just the suffering of Jesus and you can't really get a glimpse of it today because we we just don't we don't we're not real life witnesses of it I mean I think one of the closest things we can do to get a visual effect is watch Mel Gibson's movie about it right you know but Jesus he was bruised to the point where he couldn't walk anymore he was beaten on the skull with rods slapped Beard pulled out, mocked, righteous the whole time, hanging on a cross. Could have gotten off at any any time. Love kept him there. You, me, we kept him there. Will we love like that at all? He's borne our griefs. We're told to carry, to bear each other's burdens, to love each other like Christ loved us so Jesus became our sin he became like us to minister to us to sympathize to us to be compassionate towards us he's always thought about us he's always dreamed about us he's always followed us he's always carried us and I wonder can we love like that um, let's go back to John just just for a minute. And let me make a quick quick reference, and then we're going to close in Colossians real quick, just to remind us of something. So go back. I think it's John chapter twelve or so, and I'm just really going to reference it, show you where it is. You can read it later. So what you'll see uh, in the beginning of thirteen after these two chapters about Lazarus and some surrounding events and how God allowed Lazarus to go to the utter depths of sickness and even to death so that he could be raised up from the dead, Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there to the apostles because they, they were thinking if he was there, he would have just healed them like he did all the, all the other people. Mary and Martha say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here... If you had been here, even the Jews say that. Could not have this guy who healed the lame and opened blind eyes. Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? But Jesus lets him die. He lets us go to the depths of our sin sometimes. He lets us go through hard trials sometimes. Why? Why do I struggle so much with my temper? Why do I struggle so much with sexual immoral temptations? Why do we struggle? Why do we have to be so opinionated on Facebook to the point where it would uh, uh, keep us from having a relationship with somebody? Why do we got to let our political views be so strong or uh, about oils or whatever the thing is that's okay for you to do, but why do we got to voice our opinion so much that we would almost exclude any type of possibility for the gospel. We just put all those things before our... I've been watching it for the last weeks, the last few weeks. Been watching it. It's not right. 
it's not right for us to voice our opinion so strongly about something you have probably the liberty to do to where you offend somebody. It's not right. It's divisive. I've seen it. And we need to, we need to stop. It's not right for us to be so pro-whatever that people, believers, especially unbelievers, won't want to hear anything else we have to say. Who cares about your political views? Who cares about this or that? It's ridiculous. Care about their soul. Love them. Serve them. Who cares? Side note. So, he'll let us get to that point. It's for the glory of God. God allows us to be tempted. He allows us to go through things. He's not the tempter. I'm not saying that. He's not bangling, dangling bait out in front of you trying to see if you'll sin. But Jesus was led to a place where Satan came and tempted him. And we're able to pass those tests. Jesus passed those tests. We're able to overcome those things. That's what Jesus did for us. However, we go through things so that as we overcome them and as people see us overcome them, there's hope that's portrayed there. There's faith portrayed in a real Savior. And that's what we need to post on Facebook. That's what we need to live like. So here in chapter 13 is that that stuff with Lazarus is over. And what's interesting to me is that the very next episode that John interjects in this story here, it seems kind of out of place. But it's really not. Because now Jesus begins to serve his, his disciples. And he begins, as we know, it says this. It says, now before the feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father. He loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. That's all we're going to read about that. But notice the preface that John gives is that Jesus knows something. He knows that like this plane's going down and that pilot hits the eject button, Jesus is about to hit the eject button. He's about to get out of this world. All the suffering, all the problems, all the bearing of our griefs and putting up with people uh, in the flesh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be over with. He can hit the eject button if he wants to, knowing that his hour had come. But he doesn't, does he? He just acts like it's not even there. And even on the cross, he drinks that cup. And Jesus, it says that supper being ended, you know, the devil put in Judas's heart to betray him. Jesus, he takes off some of his outer robes and he girds himself. He girds himself in the towel and in the role of a servant. And he begins to stoop down and wash his disciples' feet. This on the heels of, of uh, Mary washing Jesus' feet with her tears. That just happened in the chapter before. And I think what John and Jesus are trying to show us is that, sure, we're like the sisters. We serve around here. We do a lot of things. We can preach and we can vacuum and we can serve at people's homes. You know, we, we serve and we're hospitable. We do those things. And we might even be like, like Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus. We love to come to church and hear the word. And we even worship the Lord. We, we tear up and we cry over all that God has done for us. But will we be like Jesus and take the role of a real life servant in the flesh? Will we wash each other's feet? That's what the thing is about. It's not about washing their feet. The topic is about forgiveness that John includes because Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. 
Peter says, well, not only my feet, my whole head, wash my whole body. Jesus says this. This is the point of the message. He says, he who is clean, he doesn't need to wash his body. He only needs to wash the filth off his feet. And that's family. That's church. It's coming along beside each other and washing each other's feet, encouraging each other, not just rebuking all the time, being patient on our hands and knees, loving kindness, mercy, washing, cleansing, loving. That's Jesus. Turn to Colossians real quick and the band can come on up. So just a reminder out of Colossians before we go into Philemon. This is the house that God hopes to erect right? This is the example that he's given us. This is what he's done for us. How dare we not being recipients of all of this, not do our best or ask for forgiveness when we don't share the love and the grace of God. Amen. So in Colossians chapter one and two, you know, Paul gives all of the resources for overcoming the flesh, right? Because that's how we start out. Like, why do we have this disconnect, this constant thing of failure? And what I notice about Paul in both Ephesians and Colossians, midway through the book, that's when he begins to transition and say something really important and get specific about behaviors, and so he never brings up any individual behavior in the first half of each book. And to me, that's, that's really interesting. But it's, it's very basic. And it's the point of the two books is that you can't do anything unless it's by the Spirit of God. <laughs> you need him. I need him. But it is possible. And so he just says in his, in his prayer in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, listen, I'm, I'm asking, I'm praying that you be filled with knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy, so that you may fully please him. And then all that he talks about is the fullness and the resources, the wisdom and the knowledge, and trying to grow them in their understanding about all that Christ has done for them. And that's what we need to be thinking about. That's the only way me and you will ever be able to do anything. It's to look at Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's to meditate on and to think on and to read in Christ and how He's been so merciful and so good and so kind and how he, old things have passed away. I'm a new creation in Christ, even though I don't feel like it. It's the quote verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's the resource. That's why Paul says that it's Christ in you. Christ is in you. He is in you. There's hope for you. I know you feel like you're in grave clothes and you're failure and you're discouraged and you're going through things and it's repeat over and over again. But there's a treasure in you. There's a man who came and he crushed sin. He bore it all. He became your sorrow. He became your grief. He became your temptation and your tribulation. Jesus Christ came and he carried it. He bore it. He became it. And it was buried in the grave and he rose from the dead. Proving victory over the grave. And now we can cry out, saints. Oh, death, where is your sting? Depression and sin. Where is your victory? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If the Old Testament saint could cry out and he could think, by you, I can run against the troop. I can leap over a wall. How much more can we do 
over our trials and our tribulations. There's hope. But the answer, it's interjected in the middle of the book. Let us not forget the transition point. Verse 1 of 3. If you then were raised with Christ, if that's happened to you, you need to put your mind on it. That's the disconnect in the moment in the car ride. It's not my kid's fault. It's not their fault. It's my fault because I've been given everything the Bible says already that pertains to life and to godliness. It's promised to me. And all I need to do, Peter says, is to be diligent to add it to your faith. And that's the proof that your call and election is sure and that you've been changed. Is that you're diligent, that you want it. That's the sacrifice God is requiring, not lip service, but diligence by the grace of God. It's the tumble setting on the washer if it has to be. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek it. Quit wasting your time. Quit wasting your time on Facebook and all of the other things. Quit wasting your time thinking about the project and doing this. Insert all that God has, be, has given you. Seek it as if it was more than that paycheck. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And don't just seek it now. Set your mind on it. That speaks of a growing practice of discipline. God help us. God help us. You can keep playing. To seek and to set our minds on it. And so that's what I want to invite you to do today. That's the invitation in the middle of the book. He's like, look, you've got all this available, but you can't do this unless you do this. Seek those things which are above where Christ is. Don't you know what you have available to you? God has given us everything. Ephesians, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's there waiting. Seek it, set your mind on it, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the disconnect. Let us press in and let us love like Jesus loves. Amen? Amen. There was a good word spoken um, even in the prayer before this message that um, we need to 